But today, we are right on time, and we're extremely excited to have everybody in the building. And we would like to call upon Mr. Jumanne Mtambalike, the chairman of Sahara Sparks and Sahara Ventures. Karibu sana, and share your knowledge. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much, Soba. So, uh, morning, guys. Are you excited? Yeah, so um, thank you so much, His Excellency. Uh, Honorable Dr. Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete. We are very honored and humbled to have you here today. As you can see, there's a lot of energy, a lot of young people. So traditionally, just to inform you, Sahara Sparks is not a conference. It's a marketplace, it's a place where people meet. That's why you're hearing a lot of noises. There's, there's no a lot of protocols. Yeah, so uh, that being said, I don't want to consume more time. I would like to welcome you on stage for your first activity. So please, we are humbled and honored to have you, sir. And uh, I would like to welcome on stage Irene. Irene Kiwia, she will be our moderator today. She will help to facilitate this conversation with the former president. Thank you. Good morning. Where's the energy just, that I just witnessed? Good morning. Good morning. Your Excellence, President Kikwete, it's an honor to be on stage with you. Well, thank you for having me here. I'm intimidated. <laughs> you, you don't look like it at all. It's actually been three years since you left office, Your Excellence. First, tell us a little bit about what you've been doing. You look really well and happy and youthful. What have you been up to? <laughs> what did you want me to look like? <laughs> Well, I'm, um, I'm happy, I, I'm relaxed, I'm leading a stressless life. The other job was, uh, there was too much heavy lifting in that, the other job. Well, now I'm, I'm busy with my pineapples, my papaya, and my cows. At times, cows give me a, a bit of headache. <laughs> because they fall sick, they die, so when they die, I feel so sad. But otherwise, I'm, I'm fine. Now, that's really great. And after 45 years of being, over 45 years of being in the public service, you retired, but because you're so passionate and committed to saving humanity, you continued working. We congratulate and thank you for that. Okay. Well, th thank you, thank you. Um, of course, I've, I'm, I'm retired. Uh, but not tired. I'm retired, <laughs> but not tired. Also, the definition, you know, retire. It's just putting on new tires, that's all. <laughs> I put on new tires, I'm doing something different from what I used to do. Of course, right now, I'm, um, I'm quite occupied in the international space. I'm a member of the International Commission for, Finan international Com Commission for Financing Global Education Opportunity with Gordon Brown as our chair. We did uh, a very incisive analysis of the state of education in the world. And we came up with pertinent observations, came up with pertinent recommendations on what really needs to be done. The, the observation there has been that the state of the world education is, is worrisome. Um, The problem is much bigger in the, in the developing countries, where there are still too many children and young people 
who are out of school. The world numbers is, is about 200 and 250 million. 100 million of those are in Africa, unfortunately. And those who are in school, many don't complete their education. The levels, the rates of dropout is so high. In primary schools, the average is about 50%. Oh, 67% complete, 33% don't. It is not 5%, it's 33%, it's just too many kids. And those who are in school complete the education, the learning outcomes are low. Africa, only 20% of the young people, young adults can have access to secondary school education. So we are essentially a primary school, a continent of primary school leavers. And only 5% can have access to higher education. Well, that's briefly all. That's so all. We came up with a number of recommendations which we left to governments to look and implement. Of course, I'm also a member of the high-level group, high-level panel on um, every woman, every child, every adolescent, where we are looking at the health of these three main humans. Yeah. Well, Your Excellence, this is the right platform. This room is filled with innovators. So the education insights that you just shared, I'm sure we have um, innovators and entrepreneurs who are already working on that space. Yeah. Anybody working on education in the room? Great. So um, the great thing about technology is all the leapfrogging that is going to do to solve yeah. some of the issues. Yeah. Of course, on, 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 um, which is related to the technology part is the observation that we made is that come 2050, half of the world jobs will be lost to automation. Fifty percent of the jobs people are doing now, it will be lost to automation. Even drivers now, because there they are, they are driverless cars coming, even drivers will lose jobs. Almost everybody is going to lose a job. <laughs> so only those with the highest levels of skills will be employed. So it is critical that people invest in education to prepare the human capital on the African continent to be able to be employable come 2050 when a lot of these jobs will be lost to innovation. So you guys are doing the right things. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellence. Let's talk a little bit about some exciting projects that you're doing. You're doing a lot of exciting projects, but this particular one, a book that we have been waiting for for a long time that you're working on, titled The Journey of My Life from a Barefoot Schoolboy to President. Yes. Take us back to that time when you were a barefoot schoolboy and tell us a little bit about the contents of this book. What should we expect? Well, of course. Be, be, <clears throat> I've had the ambition of writing. Uh, about my work, my life. And whenever I talk to people about what we've been doing, they say, but have you written this? Have you written about this? So I will write, I will write. Well, fortunately, 
I have a friend at the New York University. They've been inviting me to speak from time to time. And then they again ask me the same question. Have you written? Are you writing? They said, I'm thinking about it. What they did was to create a facility for me. They gave me a beautiful apartment, a huge one, where I could stay with all my security team. Because, you know, when I became president, I was told, when they gave me the security detail, they told me, look here, we are your lifetime partners. We will always be there. And we will always be with you after death as well. Because we will be there to guard your grave. So they said, there is no way that you can, you can do away with us. So when the university said, we're going to provide you with accommodation, I said, oh, I have a huge baggage with me. They said, don't worry. So they gave me five wonderful apartments, good facilities. So they said, this is your facility. Think right. And then they gave me two young people who are working with the university. One of them turns, happens to be a Tanzanian. Who is at that university? They said, these are the people who are going to assist you. So I will be doing the talking. They will be doing the recording. The others with their computer, there will be the transcripts. So we finished the book from first chapter to the last chapter in this form. It took us about 10 weeks to do that. Then I'm, I'm, I'm in the second phase, the phase of me editing the transcripts. The editing itself is actually the actual writing. Now it's me writing. Because when I was talking, it was very brief. But now I've got to write it. I've got to look for the data, data and all the information that, that... Some of the information is very old information. So we finished that part. So I'm still continuing with this part of editing. And I think by, by December I'll finish it. i finish this part. And after that, now it will become the, the most difficult job of getting the money to publish the book. Can you raise the money, Yairin? I am <laughs> sure I can. <laughs> yeah, so that's this part. So according to, to my thinking and the, and the people at New NYU, we think by January the book should be ready for launch. So what we did was what they call book reading, talking about the various chapters in the book, what, what is its content. Some thought it was the launching of the book. It's not yet launched. But it is, it is a, 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 a transition phase towards the end of the book. Well, I grew up, I was born in the village of Umsoga. 68 years ago. In fact, three days ago, I celebrated my 60th birthday. <laughs> oh, on the 7th of October. <laughs> I'm saying, me, eh? <laughs> I'm an old man now, I'm not young. The looks are deceptive. <laughs> Two years' time, I'll be 70, so you can imagine. So I was born there. Of course, my father was, a, was a, a, a colonial civil servant. But my grandfather decided that, who was a chief, decided that I stay with him. So I stayed with him in the village. I lived the life of a, of a normal village boy, barefoot. After, 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 after going through the... Ile jando sasa inetuaje kwa kingereza. Initiation? After the initiation. <laughs> of something. <laughs> yeah, the initiation, I yes. say. In the book, I use the word initiation. After going through the initiation, it's a huge ceremony. So I got shoes. Shoes? Yes, I got shoes after the initiation. 
So I went to school with the shoes. The teacher called me at the end of the classes. He says, tomorrow don't come with the shoes. Because everybody else doesn't have shoes. So that's why I grew up a barefoot schoolboy. I went to primary school, to middle school, Ugoba. People were not wearing shoes. The first time I wear shoes, I wore shoes when I went to Kiba Secondary School, where it was mandatory to have shoes. Wow. And we grew up with shoes. So That's a challenge. Yeah, my, 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 of course, when I tell this to my grandchildren, they said, oh, no, 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 Grandpa, you, you are lying. How? how? How did you manage? I said, well, <laughs> the immune system is just great. Yeah. So we, we cannot really wait to, um, to read the book. And uh, I will personally organize your launch. I've just volunteered in I, I Tanzania. Th I thought you were going to organize the money to publish the book. <laughs> the money and the launch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Your Excellency. Thank you so much. What an inspiring story. I can, I can imagine mm. that young, no shoes, and the future must have been bleak. I don't know. Like, were you... How did you view the world? No, I was point? very happy. You know, look here, because everybody else was like, like me. We were just happy kids. I was saying the only moment I had a lot of difficulties growing up was when my mother fell sick. Because she, she, had, she, had, she had a stillbirth, complicated pregnancy, and my father brought, brought her back to the village and she was very sick, groaning, all the time, you know, in just pain. I really thought that my mother was going to die. So whenever I come from school, the first stop is to her room, check if she was still there. I play with the other kids. After some time, I go back to see my mother. Until when she pulled up. You know, that, that was my most difficult time growing up. And perhaps that's why you're well vested in supporting maternal um, health and... Of course, that, that, that's one, because I have a practical lesson. But the other also, I lost several siblings of mine to diseases, to malaria, and so on. One of them who, who was born after me, born 1952, his name was Ramadan. He was, he was my playmate. So he... He contracted malaria and died. So I was a small kid. I didn't know where he, where he went. So I'd always ask Mama, when, when is Ramadan coming back? So I was, you know, I... So this, this, these are some of those experiences that when I look back and when I got the opportunity, I said, one thing I must do is fight with malaria. Those who are here will know we, we launched that big campaign. Zinduka, malaria, haikubaliki. We had a huge campaign. It had wonderful outcomes. Infection rates fell to 51%. And infant mortality rates from malaria fell by 71%. So this is one thing because I've had this practical experience of course, I've been having malaria from time to time. <laughs> then, of course, maternal and child health, mm. maternal mortality, mm. child mortality mm. was too high. But women and children are dying of causes that can be prevented, of diseases that can be cured. I said, as president, I have that responsibility. So we worked so hard to reduce maternal mortality, child mortality. We were able to meet the, SD, the MDG with the under five mortality. That's when we were able to meet two years before, before the 2015 deadline. We were able to reduce maternal mortality, but we failed short of meeting the MDG, MDG target. Because <clears throat> when I came in, it was 580 death for every 100,000 life birth. We pulled it down to 454. We went down to 432 by the time I left. But we were supposed to get to 191. 
death per 100,000 live births. For we were at 432. Of course, you cannot finish everything. The recent statistics, you know, are heartbreaking in the sense that maternal mortality rates have, have gone up again. It's 556. So I said, well, it's a tall order because under the SDGs now, we are supposed to get to 90 for every 100,000 live births by 2030, 12 years, 12 years away. So we have, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. That's why I said on retirement, let me continue to contribute in the fight against maternal mortality and child mortality. That's one of the major strategic objectives of my foundation. Uh, we, we appreciate the work that you're doing with the Jakai Equator Foundation. Let's talk a little bit about innovation, sir. Huh? Innovation. 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 Yes. When you were in leadership, how did you approach innovation? <clears throat> and what would you have done differently? How? How did you approach innovation during your leadership? Mm. And what do you think, knowing what you know now, what do you think you would have done differently? Well, I, th I think what I did was the best under the circumstances. <laughs> because look here. Tanzania. In fact, the whole of the east coasts of the African continent was not connected to the submarine optic fiber network. It was non-existent. It was only on the west coast, up to Cape Town, up to South Africa. It was on the, on the Red Sea, the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, but on the East Coast, it was not there. So there was a time I went to US. I met a US company called Scythe Global. We were talking about investing in Stiglas Gorge. But in the discussion, they also told me the idea of, of this terrestrial the submarine terrestrial cable. And they, they told me that, you know, you are not connected. You are not connected to the global information superhighway. We are using satellites, that's all, for communication. So, okay, we agreed that let them start that. That is how we came with CECOM. But I said, OK, fine. If Seacom land, lands, lands fall in Dar es Salaam, if you don't have a nationwide optic fiber network, how are you going to make use of that? So I said, we have to invest. In the nationwide optic fiber network. So that's why we, we talked to the Chinese, we got a loan from the Chinese with Huawei, we started building the optic fiber network, connecting all the districts, connecting all the regions, all the districts in the country. Of course, we are left with the last mile. The last mile was connecting all schools, connecting all hospitals, all schools for e-education, connecting all hospitals for e-health, and connecting all government institutions so that we can have e-government. Well, by the time I left, it was almost done. So now when you get these, these young people now with this park, that park, that park, it would not have been possible if we did not invest in the terrestrial 
optic fiber network. That's one thing that we did. And then, of course, we came up with Dr. Mshinda. Where is he seated? He was with Ifakara. I took him out of Ifakara Health Institute, brought him to Costec. We said one of the things that they must do is establish incubators. Well, that's how we started. Again, it was facilitated by the investment that we made. So this, 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 is, this is the basic, the basic thing. So after that, we are able to have now Sahara is there. there are so many of these other guys sprung up with so many of the incubator hubs. But certainly, this is this. Of course, we made it as part of the government policy to promote innovation. Innovation, creativeness. Well, Max Maripo is, is a product of our, of our investment. And there are, there are so many others who have come out of that. So, as I think, as, of course, in my, in, my, in my foundation, one of the strategic obje objectives is youth. Youth entrepreneurship training. So, <clears throat> I've been working with, with a Canadian company. We are going to establish, because we, we see that the problem is, after you have done the innovation, the problem is financing, so that we can take it to the next level. So we are trying to see if of course, I, I know there are, there are a number of funds, angel funds. I, I'm working with my foundation to establish another one. We're working, we're going to call it Malaika Fund. Yeah? So it's, it's really to support startups. Let young people become innovative and creative, come up with ideas, they will be selected, and then the ones that are selected, at the end of the day, we'll be able to support them to be able to, to, st to, to, st to start up their, their businesses. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm working on the, on the innovation and uh, the technology space. That's all. Oh, that's it's a enough lot. enough for me on retirement. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> We appreciate it, and we look forward to when the fund launches so that we can all have access to it. Yeah, in, 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 in a couple of months, we should be on, on, on the ground. Okay. It is still work in progress. Mm. I think in the ne ne next month, we're going to have a few meetings to, to take it to the next level. After that, I'm sure we should be able to, to be up and running. So if you are not in the same too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank and, you, you know, so Young much. people become innovative and creative. Mm -hmm. We will not, we'll not do much. Of course, we'll start with a small capital. Uh, but later, of course, if we get more people to support, bring more money into the fund, then we'll be able to support more young people. We're looking at Tanzania, and probably after we have built ourselves, consolidated ourselves, we're looking at the African space as well. Thank you so much, Your Excellence. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful chatting with you. And did you guys enjoy? A big round of applause, please, to former President Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete. We thank you for your continued service. Any last word before, last word for the day? Oh, last word for the day. <laughs> well, first, let, let, let me thank Sahara and their partners, AfriLab, for this wonderful innovation, for this initiative. You know, the difference between developed countries and developing countries is defined by the, the level of development in education, 
the level of development in science, and the level of development in technology. They are much more developed than we are in all these aspects of human development. So focusing on education, which I mentioned earlier, I passed in one of the, one of the pavilions, one of the stands there, there are young people on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This is another aspect of education which, which we, we are not doing well. If we are not doing well in mathematics, we have lost the biggest, the master key to innovation and scientific development. So, how much are we doing to invest in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics will determine the future of, of our continent. But how much are we, invest, are we investing in the application of science and technology in the socio-economic development of our country is the ultimate, is the game changer. So Sahara, AfriLab, your involvement in, 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 in these particular aspects is something that is very welcome to me. That's why when they asked me to come, I said, I'll spare some time, you know. As a retiree now, I'm just here, I'm a squeeze. Mm. <laughs> I'm an entrepreneur, busy with the pineapples, papayas, and, and the cows. So I said, I can spare some time. Then my cows will miss me for a few hours. I'll go back later, tomorrow, see them. But I saw, let, let me just come here, rub shoulders with you guys. Well, feel the vibrations from you. It will encourage me in the work that I'm doing out in the farm. So thank you very much. Best of luck. Thank you so much, Your Excellence. Thank you. We're encouraged by your support. Before we leave the stage, we will take a selfie. We are with innovators and social media enthusiasts. If we live here without a selfie. What is a selfie? I'll show you. I've seen you taking selfies, I'm sure.